All right, hello everyone from the team at Birch Aquarium from home. I'm Caitlin, a familiar face. We also have Delaney with us this Hi. morning. Good morning, good morning. And we are so excited to say happy World Oceans Day to everyone. June 8th is World Oceans Day, a global celebration of our ocean planet. And this year, World Oceans Day is really featuring the idea of protecting and preserving our ocean planet. So with that in mind, Delaney, can you tell us again what you do at the aquarium and a little bit more about what we're gonna be talking about today? Yes, so today is World Oceans Day, so many exciting things happening. And we're gonna be talking about marine protected areas. Um, but again, my name is Delaney and I talk about marine protected areas quite a bit with a lot of our programs and education because it just so happens that the beaches right off of the aquarium are part of marine protected areas. And that's where we do a lot of our education programming. Um, so we figured what better way to celebrate World Oceans Day than talking about how you guys can help protect it. And hopefully you learned some new things today in our chat. Definitely. And I'm definitely excited to talk about these really important ocean areas as well. So let's dive right in and talk about these marine protected areas. So it's kind of a big name for what these are, but Delaney, tell us what exactly is a marine protected area? Uh, so a marine protected area, or you might have heard it as a marine managed area, they're defined, at, uh, defined as areas where there might be natural or cultural resources that have been deemed um, as needing greater protection by different levels of government. So to put that in more scientific, maybe uh, digestible terms, there's really precious organisms or habitat um, or historical relevance in this marine site that need protection, you know? So we wanna um, in place put some regulations or certain laws to make sure that those resources are protected for future generations. So um, one animal that might need protection would be the black sea bass, which you've seen us talk about here on our live chats when we're watching our kelp cam of our giant kelp forest. Um, so just one of a plethora of examples of animals that are, um, need protecting that would possibly be found in a coastal marine protected area in San Diego. Definitely. And along the entire Pacific coast and in many places on the Atlantic coast, there are actually archaeological sites which are both coastal and now because of sea levels changing over the last, you know, 10,000 years or so, um, some of those sites are now under the water as well. So as Delaney was saying, it can be natural, it can be a habitat, it can be animals that need protection, but also human history that deserves some protection as well. Really cool. And California really is a world leader in marine protected areas, which I'm really proud about. So guys, this image, it's a little hard to read everything and get every single little dot, but Delaney, can you tell us what, what are we looking at? What are all these colored dots? Yeah, so this is a map of marine protected areas along California's coastline. So one of the first things you might notice is these areas are very coastal. And that's because a lot of the coastal habitat along California has um, a really large richness of biodiversity. Which there, that means there's uh, rich habitats full of a lot of different organisms. Um, that create this this network of ecosystems that need protecting. So all of the different colored dots just represent what type of marine protected area that it is. Um, and there's there's many types as you can see. So this map here it represents five of the different types of marine managed areas that you might find. And really the differences with them it comes down to what are the regulations in place for that area meaning um, is there recreational activities allowed? Is there fishing? Can you take things from it? Can you not take things from it? Um, and like you said, it's really impressive, Caitlin, to look at California and just see all of these marine protected areas that we already have put into place. Um, there are about 124 marine managed areas off the coast of California. And of course we cross our fingers and just hope that that number continues to grow over the years. Definitely. And what's really amazing to me is that uh, California has these, but also the fact that so many of these protected areas are really close to urban parts of California. Many times you think of national parks or places like that, and they're kind of 
way out there in the middle of nowhere protecting these wild places. But these marine protected areas are along one of the busiest coastlines in the world. And, and many of them you can see right from our cities and towns, which is very cool to know that we have conservation areas just literally within view of, of the shore. So we're going to dive in haha, uh, to a few of those coming up. Um, I wanted to make another analogy real quick for anyone else who loves national parks like I do. I love going to the different parks. You might um, remember that there are national parks, there are national monuments, there are national recreation areas, there are national seashores, there are historical monuments. So there are many different types of protected areas that are managed by the National Park Service. So having this diversity of marine protected areas is actually pretty common when it comes to government regulated protection areas. So you might think, why are there so many? Well, there's so many <laughs> in all different types of areas. Very cool. All right, let's hop on to our next slide. So here in San Diego, we have three types of marine protected areas. And Delaney, I know you mentioned, can we see some of these from Birch Aquarium? Yeah, so um, we can see two just from uh, the very back of Tidepool Plaza, which is one of our exhibits that overlooks the ocean at Birch Aquarium um, in the city of La Jolla. And so the, the three types of marine protected areas in San Diego, of course, are represented with different regulations in place. Um, now, in all of San Diego, there's about 11 different marine managed areas. And, and with that, there's going to be, again, um, different rules. And some places you might find to be a little bit busier, full of recreational activity. And others you might find to be a, a lot more protected where there's no recreational activities occurring. Um, and it's highly, highly sensitive habitat. Um, so the, what we're going to do is we'll talk to you about the three types. And Caitlin and I actually have some fun stories of animals we've occurred and witnessed um, in these areas. And it might just go to show that, you know, marine protected areas have, have the benefit of allowing these animals to thrive and sort of creating a sanctuary for them um, to live their life. Definitely. And then also um, let us know in the comments if you have ever visited any of the marine protected areas that we're talking about or um, any marine protected areas that you might know where you live. I know we have a lot in California, but let us know if there's a protected place near where you live as well. Uh, we're always really excited to hear fun things that are happening in other protected parts of the world. So let's see, let's, let's go into our very first one here. Oh, I recognize that beautiful location. I would not wanna go snorkeling the day that this picture was taken though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Where is this, Delaney? So this is um, at La in La Jolla, and this is known as La Jolla Cove, or you might know it as La Jolla Shores. So the, the, the point of this picture that we're looking at actually just shows you a straight shot of what we call La Jolla Cove and all of the caves that um, kind of uh, exist on that kind of cliffside that we're looking at in this photo. And this is a really special place for us because this is actually very close to the aquarium. And we um, take people snorkeling in this state marine reserve. Um, there are people who kayak with the local kayak shops. And it's just a, an extremely special place because there's so many different habitats in this one area. Um, and the animals that you're gonna see are, are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And this particular state marine reserve, it has some of the highest protections off the coast of San Diego in that you are not allowed to bring motorized boats or boats that are larger than a, a certain size, even if they don't have a motor, um, into this space to help protect the area and to protect the creatures in that habitat. As Delaney said, kayakers are allowed in there, but kayaks are, are a little bit more manageable. And kayaks also don't produce noise pollution. So that's another thing that these animals are being protected from and their habitats. So that's pretty cool. Now, Delaney, let's see if we can, off the top of our heads, list all of the different types of habitats that are within this marine reserve. Both Delaney and I have led snorkeling groups in this area with the aquarium in the past. Um, unfortunately, we're not offering those right now. Um, but there's a lot of cool things to see in this reserve. So it's uh, some of the strategy when the state is cr creating these marine reserves is to try to get a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak, because people have a lot of opinions about what's created right outside their door and how they're gonna uh, be able to use the ocean outside 
uh, of where they like to go. So you can imagine some people might not like it if a marine reserve was created and they weren't allowed to fish there. But it's important for the policymakers to know that opinion as well as to know the opinion of the scientists and understand the facts for what makes certain areas best for marine protected areas. And one of the things that they really try to take into mind is are they protecting a lot of different habitats in a small area or is that area really unique? And this one definitely is. So let's see, Delaney, you go first. What's one habitat within this marine reserve in La Jolla? Well, one that we can see and it's close to shore is uh, the rocky intertidal or tide pools. Part of our programming at the aquarium too is taking people to these tide pools. Definitely, tide pools are an important one, and also those rocky cliffs extend up, and you see a lot of birds that will nest, specifically those big black cormorants, and then some gulls will also nest here. So this is an important bird nesting area on the cliffs. So I would conclude the cliffs as part of the marine protected area. Yeah. Right, what else? Um, so just out of the tide pools, you go into the sandy seafloor or the sandy shore. Um, and I know I've seen tons of animals just sitting on the sandy bottom. One time snorkeling in this area, I saw probably two dozen shovel-nosed guitar fish just sitting on the bottom. Whoa. And it's of a shovel-nosed guitar fish. It's one of the coolest looking animals. It's kind of a mix between a shark and a stingray. Um, they have, as their name might suggest, kind of a guitar body shape to them. Um, and sandy floor holds a lot of different organisms for them to chew on. It's a way for them to protect themselves because they might hide or blend in with the sand. Uh, but that's another habitat that you would find in the state marine reserve. Definitely. And right against that sandy shore habitat, we actually have a seagrass bed that's part of this one as well. Seagrass is one of the few true flowering plants that lives underneath the ocean, and it's found in sandy bottom habitats and that habitat is a great place for animals to hide, but also it provides food for many animals like green sea turtles that we've seen here. A lot of people think San Diego's waters are too cold to have sea turtles come close by, but there are many people who have seen the sea turtles here in La Jolla and uh, especially in the summertime. So if you're ever snorkeling there, keep an eye out if you're near the eelgrass beds or seagrass beds. I feel Definitely. like there's a big habitat that we haven't talked about yet. That's an important yeah, one. Yeah, so just beyond that is the kelp forest, which we've talked so much about here in our live chats. And the kelp forest is obviously home to a um, little over 800 different species of animals. That's just one habitat in the state marine reserve. And a recreational activity that we haven't talked about yet that a lot of people um, do here because of the kelp forest is scuba diving. So scuba diving is allowed in the state marine reserve and it's actually one of the most popular spots in Southern California to dive is in the kelp forest here um, right off of La Jolla. So that kelp forest is another really, really important part of this area. Beautiful. And mm -hmm. and this marine protected area that we're talking about here in La Jolla, it extends north up into La Jolla Shores beach area. So in the portion that extends uh, further north, you're also actually capturing a bit of the open ocean habitat as well. There's a very deep submarine canyon that comes close to shore. If you imagine like the Grand Canyon, whoa, spoiler alert, there are canyons under the ocean as well. And what's really cool is that brings a lot of really deep ocean or open ocean species close to shore during different times of year. So from uh, the Marine Reserve here in La Jolla, we actually sometimes can see gray whales passing through on their migration. They'll come from the open ocean and kind of hugging the coast and play in that kelp forest or maybe hide from orcas. And orcas or killer whales actually were spotted a few years ago right here from La Jolla Cove. And I know that we found out and we were like crying because we didn't <laughs> know that they had gone by. But it's so cool. So so let's are there any other habitats in here? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we missed. If we missed anything else, let us know in the comments. But yeah. we had intertidal, we had sandy shore, which I think includes the sandy beach. We had the cliffs, we had the kelp forest, we had the open ocean. So that's at least five different yeah. habitats 
all within one marine reserve. So I'm really glad that this particular marine reserve in, in San Diego has some of the highest protections and will continue to have that. It's really cool. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Um, Lara has a question for us. Does the creation or the protection of marine protected areas also depend on the biodiversity of the area? Yes, I yes. think so. Uh, many scientists are studying the coastlines here in California. We're going to be using California as an example because it is our home. And then also because Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientists, as well as scientists with California Sea Grant, which is another really great organization that is um, part of, of a, a whole nationwide network, but the California Sea Grant is based at Scripps Oceanography as well. They are doing a lot of research to, to understand what parts of the California coast should be nominated or get more protection for marine protected areas. So they can make recommendations to the government organizations to try to get these areas to be protected. So if there's more biodiversity there, then we will have more uh, likelihood to have a marine protected area, but it can sometimes be a slow process. So that was a really great question, Laura, and I feel like I might have danced around it a little bit, but if there's more biodiversity, then it's more likely to get protection down the line, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's head to our next marine protected area that we have here in San Diego. So what's this, what's, what's this one, Delaney? I recognize those cliffs. So this is just north of Scripps Pier, which is a research pier for Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And this is the State Marine Conservation Area. Now, um, the State Marine Reserve we just looked at is a no-take zone. And this State Marine Conservation Area um, actually has limited um, take from it. And what that means is because this is uh, meant for, for science, um, though there are some recreational activities that occur like surfing or boogie boarding, um, not many people snorkel or scuba dive in this site because there's not as diverse of habitats um, on this side of La Jolla. But the marine conservation area is a little bit different. The word conservation there is an important piece. When talking about marine protected areas, it's really this marriage between management and conservation. So um, through the different levels of government and those involved, how are we keeping in mind conservation and able to manage these different areas depending on what needs to be protected? So this being so close to Scripps Pier, um, that's a research pier and there are boats that researchers and scientists take in order to use the surrounding area for their research. Um, so if you're a scientist that's tide pools or um, local wave energy, or maybe even the way the cliffs erode and bring new um, piles of sand into the water, how does that change the shape of the sandy beach? All of those are different types of research that might occur in this area. Um, but this is again, just north of Scripps Pier and um, this area doesn't tend to be as busy in terms of recreational activities. But again, it's, it's a different type of managed area and the, the ability to take things from the speech just depends on what the purpose is for. Definitely. And um, many of you who have ever gone tide pooling uh, with Birch Aquarium, you may have actually gone tide pooling uh, in this area, north of Scripps Pier. There are some beautiful tide pools there. And those tide pools are protected within this marine conservation area. So one of the reasons you might want to protect tide pools is because one, they're already under a lot of stress with climate change and sea level rise and pollution and many things like that. But two, some people might think mussels are delicious. And so <laughs> we wanna make sure that these are not being taken from that area. Uh, the University of California system, which Birch Aquarium is part of, we're part of UC San Diego, actually has a, a statewide reserve system as well. This is not part of it, but there are some coastal marine reserves that are kind of go hand in hand with the UC reserve system. And many of those were created to protect these research sites so that the scientists don't run into the problem of having them be destroyed without realizing it. I know there was a story that um, there was a, a, a UC scientist who was doing research in Arizona and he was studying lizards and kind of the natural Sonoran habitat. Sorry, we're taking a quick tangent. Um, but what happened was, this was uh, quite a few years ago, maybe about, I don't know the date, but it was quite a few years ago. And so he had this research 
there. He was doing the research for quite a long time. And then he came back for the next field season and the entire research site had been demolished for a housing development. And so the UC reserve system helps create these wild places so that scientists from all over UC and from all over the world can go and keep long-term research projects going. And so Scripps Peer is part of one of those very long-term data sets where they're taking the temperature, the salinity, the pH of the water for more than a hundred years. And that's all being done within this marine conservation area. So without having fluctuations of a ton of boats going by and stirring up the ocean water or having, you know, buildings and things like that too close, Scripps is also able to get a very consistent data set and one that they can use to help inform more decisions to help protect our oceans. So it's pretty cool to have these sort of things just off our coast, but then also, also a little bit affiliated with the UC research system, which is really, really neat. Um, Delaney, what's the coolest thing you've ever seen in this particular marine? Reserve. Oh, wow. It's or hard to conservation. It. Um, but, you know, what's so interesting is that there's less kind of foot traffic on this side of the beach. So sometimes you might spot animals that you maybe don't see a little bit um, further south um, down the beach here because that's where there tends to be more people in the water. But I have seen leopard sharks and big bat rays, big mother bat rays and smaller um just just newly born baby bat rays swimming um, just at the surface of the water from this side, just north of Scripps Pier. Um, like you said, I've seen gray whales um, swimming close to shore on this side because there's not as many people in the water. And um, another interesting part of this marine conservation area is the cliffs and um, just the history that the cliffs hold in terms of the different rocks that have formed over thousands, millions of years and just seeing the history of our coastal land um, in those rocks, in that cliffside, is really beautiful too. So Definitely. this that goes back to the historical relevance, you know, um, with people, and that's another reason why there's marine protected areas. It's it's that um, that people component of you know what is the history this place holds because those are things that also need protecting too. Definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely, and I think that this area is is de one that has all a, a huge diversity of factors from the geology, like you were saying, to the sandy shore, the tide pools, and into the water. And then also that um, submarine canyon that we mentioned earlier is still pretty close to shore here. If anybody has been to Black's Beach to go surfing or other things, um, that is an area where there's an amazing surf break that's just north of this marine reserve, but that surf break is there because of the submarine canyon. But that also means that some of those open ocean species do end up in this region and it was a few years ago there i did not see it but there was actually a pygmy sperm whale which is a very very rare type of open ocean species of whale it was a, a young one stranded here just north of scripps pier and so um it was taken to be rehabilitated i don't think it made it but it was an example of a very very unusual species that we rarely if ever see in Southern California waters, but ended up right here at La Jolla Shores Beach and in this marine conservation area. And so sometimes you never know what is just offshore that also deserves protecting as well. So it's it's really, there's so much to learn, <laughs> even though Scripps is right there, so neat. Now our next marine conservation area or our next area might look a little bit different, but anybody who has driven along the coast highway or the one here in Southern California might recognize this area. So where, where's this Delaney? Yeah, this is San Alejo Lagoon. So this is in um, North County, San Diego. So um, this is interesting because we the last two different marine protected areas we looked at are pretty much the beach right there, right offshore. But this one is actually a protected lagoon. And there are actually a few different networks of lagoons further up in North County, San Diego. And this is definitely different habitat and wildlife. This has probably a richer abundance of seabirds and different marsh species that you might find that need protecting. Um, and in this area, and um, being in San Diego, a lot of people love hiking, love going outside. Um, now, what's different with this state marine conservation area, 
prior to the one we just talked about near Scripps Pier is that this is a completely a no-take zone. So um, this is such a precious protected habitat that yes, there are hiking trails around it, information center, but absolutely a no-take zone. So um, you know that's something that's important to keep in mind and to consider when these areas are established is like, back to what is the type of um, life that lives there? What is this habitat that is needing to be protected? And another interesting thing, and Caitlin, you mentioned this, is um, looking at, at the housing that it's just bordering up to this really precious habitat. And actually, almost all sides of it. Um, but yeah, this looks a lot different than the um, coastal ocean habitats that we were just talking about. Definitely. And with this one, we talked about the many different reasons why areas could be protected. But But this one is really, I would say, the whole ecosystem is important. The entire marsh habitat, not only for the animals that live there, but these marshes are often a nursery for many different birds, but then also fish species. In some parts of uh, central and northern California, leopard sharks will actually go into estuaries like this. Uh, they think maybe to pup, they haven't completely confirmed that. But then also the services that this area gives to people is also very important as well because we don't live in a bubble. You know, people are living right on the edge of this this reserve and this marsh, and so our lives are more intertwined than many people realize. This marsh is being fed by by a river that's coming in from inland of San Diego, and the marsh not only slows down the water so that it doesn't do a ton of erosion to the coastline, it's also filtering that water and cleaning that water through a variety of processes with everything from bacteria and, and little teeny tiny microscopic things that might eat any pollutants that are in the water to the actual sea grasses themselves and marsh grasses that are slowing down the flow and are able to help filter out pollutants and sediment before it's washed immediately into the ocean. So not only is this an important place for the animals, it's an important place for people because we like to have clean oceans to go swim as well. There's a state beach right here. I don't know if anyone's gone there before, but it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And any of the pollutants that are coming in are significantly reduced because we have this protected marsh there as well. So double duty, pretty cool. <laughs> oh man. Avid bird watcher, um, you know, a place like San Alejo Lagoon is a wonderful place to go bird watching. Um, oh, definitely. So many different types of bird species that you'll see. Uh, yeah, so. there's um, particularly one if you ever try to go bird watching along the marshes in San Diego, there's a particular type of marsh bird that is endangered. It's called the clapper rail, kind of a funny name for a bird. But they're a beautiful bird and they have big feet and they'll kind of walk around in these marshes. And so if you're there, you might hear somebody getting excited. Oh, did you see a clapper rail? And you go, maybe. <laughs> but definitely some of the wading birds are easy to see here, like the great blue herons or white egrets and things like that. A very fun activity. Um, if you are going to go visit this area, please make sure you take a look at many of the signs that are there that tell you the rules and regulations. For example, you don't want to just put on some boots and go clomping through the marsh. That would be counterintuitive to the reserve. We want to keep it pristine for the animals. So make sure you're always taking a look at the different rules and regulations and, and paying attention to those. And some of these areas do have trails and boardwalks that you can go on. The Tijuana River Estuary, that area is uh, has many walking trails that you can go see and has similar bird life to this. So very cool. Just make sure you're following, following the rules. Yeah. Let's see. All right. So, oh, we are back to Scripps Pier. And this is just kind of showing us. So we were talking about before the Marine Reserve that was affiliated with the La Jolla Cove. And then it went a little bit further north. And then north of Scripps Pier, there was another one. So Delaney, is this the point where they meet? Yes. Yeah, so um, I wanted to show this picture because we just talked about the three different uh, marine protected areas that you can find in San Diego. And this just shows you how defined the lines can be between areas that are protected. 
Um, and these are even lines that would be defined between an area that's protected and an area that's not protected. So not a marine um, protected area. So these are the two that we were talking about in La Jolla and you can really just see how defined those lines are. So if you are going to be someone who wants to go fishing or um, like you said, there's no motorized boats allowed. It's really important to know not only where these lines are defined, but how far offshore they go. So Definitely. from the aquarium, looking out and seeing the San Diego Scripps Coastal Marine Conservation Area and looking at the, the one that's further south, which is this, the Marine Reserve, you will see boats out in the distance, but that's because they understand the rules and regulations and they are beyond the marine protected areas where fishing is allowed. So um, do animals know where these lines are? Absolutely not. You know, people ask, um, we had a question earlier about, you know, would a, one species overpopulate that area because it's protected? Animals right. don't know those lines in the ocean. Um, it really, it's for people to understand where they can and can't go. And there's still research being done um, to observe how species might recover or how populations might stabilize over time in these certain areas, because that's really important research and data sets to have in order to continue to grow this network of marine managed areas off of our coast whether that's in California or off any coast in the United States. Um, so it's important to just understand these things. And if you're someone who's going to enjoy some recreational boating, these are um, the types of regulations and laws that you're going to want to look up. But I just found this picture Definitely. fascinating. See that line going right out into the water. <laughs> Sometimes there are buoys to help you, but many times there are not. And yeah. it's not only for the animals that you want to keep that in mind. There are some pretty hefty fines um, mm -hmm. that people can can get as well. Um, something I wanted to bring up because this picture really does illustrate how you know humans are really great at drawing lines, but in the ocean, animals and other organisms are free floating and free swimming. Um, a, a, a word that you'll hear quite often when it comes to marine protected areas is a term called spillover effect. It's very jargony, but spillover, just as it implies, is that if animals are protected within a marine protected area, they are going to have a chance to not have the fishing pressure, not have the pressure of, of extra human activity there, and hopefully we'll be able to reproduce and then also grow bigger than they would have been if they were being fished from when they were babies. So the spillover effect is the idea that as these fish stay in these protected areas when they're young, as they grow older, they will spill over the edge of the reserves to help populate other areas surrounding them. Now, there was a lot of argument for many years as to whether or not this was true, but thankfully, scientists do as they do, and they did a lot of research to find out that, yes, the spillover effect is a positive part of marine protected areas. So if you are ever checking out the marine protected area that's near La Jolla Cove, you might see a lot of fishermen sitting right at the edge of a marine protected area. And what they're doing is they're trying to take advantage of the spillover effect or those animals that have had a chance to grow within that. Is that legal? Yes. Can they deny that spillover effect is not a thing? No, because they're fishing and taking advantage of it. But I think a really great example of this is that Scripps Oceanography scientists are currently uh, studying the giant black sea bass, as Delaney mentioned earlier. That's our, our big mama, our big girl that we have in our giant kelp forest. She's about 300 pounds and she's a small one um, and still growing. But giant black sea bass were very overhunted for, for many, many years uh, because they're, they're curious and they will approach divers and boats. So they were taken by traditional rod and reel fishermen uh, from really the like 1920s, 1910s, 1930s on, and then also um, by spear fishermen. So now these giant black sea bass are protected in multiple marine protected areas in Southern California. And they're Scripps research teams. And we actually have um, a few people on our staff, Melissa, who you might remember, she helps take care of our giant kelp forest, have actually helped with the giant black sea bass counts. They will go and scuba dive and do a transect line or swim along a line and count how many giant black sea bass, this endangered species that they see, 
within these marine reserves. And they are seeing more than were, were cataloged in the past. So there's a success story that's still in the process of happening. They're still endangered, but the marine protected areas are making a difference in that particular species. So that's really cool. Yeah, and if you've ever seen a juvenile black sea bass, they're one of the most adorable ocean animals you'll see. <laughs> Not seeing but they, you know, this is amazing that something so small grows to be something so large and just important and immense in, a, in an ecosystem like a kelp forest. So, yeah, a really important species. And like you said, Caitlin, MPAs are, are starting to benefit them, which is really cool. Yes. Yes, indeed. So I think that we've really touched on why marine protected areas are important. Um, but if there's anything else that you guys can think of in the comments, why you think they are important, please let us know. Um, I mean, we've talked about how they're important for animals. They're important for habitats. They're important for people. Um, what else, Delaney? Are we missing anything? I mean, animals and people it is a huge, huge part of why these are so important. And they provide educational opportunities too. Um, you know, for, for the aquarium, having those marine protected areas pretty much in our backyard is really important for a lot of our programming to educate people. And it provides people a space to see these animals that they otherwise might not be able to see because it maybe would not have been a protected area. Um, but they're so important for so many reasons. And it's important to um, encourage that this network continues to grow, just like national parks. If you've been to a national park on land, you understand that feeling and that impact of when you walk into whether it's a forest or a desert and, and you, you see how it's untouched, it's pristine and animals are thriving. That's the same protections that um, you know we want for, for these coastal areas you know, it, it's below water, so it's harder to feel that impact as a human because you might not necessarily get to swim through a kelp forest and see all those animals as you would be walking through a forest on land seeing animals and plants. But it's really important. So um, I, you know, we just encourage you to keep thinking about what your connection is to it. And again, lots of reasons why, like you said, Caitlin. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And and I did see uh, Lara had a, a follow-up question about the historical artifacts and are there any in Southern California? Well, yes. In fact, in the Marine Reserve here in La Jolla, the one that protects La Jolla Cove and most of La Jolla Shores Beach, they have found uh, relics. They have found artifacts from the Kumeyaay people who inhabited this region uh, for a very long time. And so many of these relics were, were ancient. They were very old. And I know that in the Scripps Oceanography geological collections, they actually have little clay bowls that they found under the ocean here in San Diego that are Kumeyaay's people's bowls. And they were bowls that they found both in archeological sites here on land further inland. And they've also found them under the ocean, which is very, very cool. So yes, there are many important sites here in, in California. And then also if you go further north up to say the Pacific Northwest or Alaska, there are many sites that are protected areas that include uh, pictographs, which are shipped stone drawings that have, have cultural significance uh, to many native peoples. And lots of those are protected up on the coasts up in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest as well. So uh, again, human history, another important one that we definitely can't can't negate with these. All right, so Odalini, here's a, a follow-up talking about uh, uh, what you were saying about national parks. Yeah, so this just shows you this is national marine protected areas and maybe the different ways that they're expressed, whether that's through a national park, some type of sanctuary, um, tribal areas, you know, you're touching on the Kumeyaay and, and finding those really important historical artifacts that are important to the culture and the history of, of San Diego. And so um, depending on where you're from, you know, you said we're using California as an example, but these marine protected areas might be expressed through different terms. So, so it's really important to understand, you know, local areas, if there's different wildlife refuge that, what are the, what do those terms mean and, and what are the types of protections that are in place? And keeping in mind, it could be for that human element of, of that, that history of the cultural history. It could be for animals, it could be for plants. So this is just an interesting graphic to kind of show you that 
there's lots of different terms and lots of umbrella terms that that might encompass what a marine protected area actually means. Definitely. Very cool. So uh, this was an important one to bring up as well, is that marine protected areas are not only in salt water. They're not only in marine waters. Tell us a little bit more about that, Delaney. So if you're from the Midwest, um, the Great Lakes are actually a part of the network of protected areas. So um, a really great example is that the Great Lakes actually have a lot of history in terms of archaeological findings and importance. There is um, a part of this network of protected areas in the Great Lakes. There's actually one MPA that contains 150 shipwrecks, which Whoa. is essential. Imagine I didn't that. know that. How cool. Yeah, so um, it's the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in the Great Lakes. And um, imagine the history that that holds. So maybe not as much in terms of um, diversity of animals, but just um, having that history and having it be protected is really, really important. So you can imagine that that provides, and uh, we actually had someone comment, Diana, talking about, she just wrote ecotourism. Yeah, I know. I was going to put that one up too. <laughs> yeah, ecotourism, <laughs> exactly. And here uh, it's also, you know, <laughs> people's history. So very, very cool. Um, along yeah. the lines of talking about wrecks, I mean, there are many in Hawaii, especially around Pearl Harbor, there are many protected areas that are part of both our national monument system and the marine protected area system that are are centered around Pearl Harbor and, and the tragedy that happened there. So thinking about native peoples, thinking about modern human history, thinking about all different types of people, it's really cool that these areas are protected for future generations to learn more about all of our history. Yeah. Great. <laughs> really cool. All right, and this is a very exciting marine reserve to me. Delaney, tell us more about this amazing marine reserve. So talking about a small marine reserve like the ones off of La Jolla, or talking about ones that aren't necessarily in salt water and are more about maybe um, modern history, this one is actually um, in the Pacific Ocean. It's the Pacific Islands, and it's actually the largest region of marine protected areas in the world, um, covering a little over half a million square miles um, is the part of the Hawaiian Islands. And you can imagine um, how important this network of islands are to protect. Um, as you might know, islands that might contain coral reef habitats, coral reefs contain some of the most um, abundant um, organisms in the world in terms of any marine habitat or marine ecosystem. The number of organisms that live there is monumental compared to other habitats. So this huge network um, being protected is so important and so valuable to not only the animals that live there, but the people as well. And yeah, just seeing this graphic and thinking half a million square miles, um, you know, really just, amazing. It's, it's amazing that it's already a part of that network. And you just think about how many other islands, you know, hopefully um, can be a part of that network one day. Definitely. And and seeing this huge space um, actually brings up another thing that, that we haven't really talked about, but one of the biggest challenges for marine reserves and marine protected areas is actually enforcement for those rules and regulations. So for the ones we've been talking about here along the coast in San Diego, we have our lifeguards, they can see everything with their binoculars. If anything's going on, they can call the Coast Guard, they have, you know, bring in helicopters, they are able to pretty easily keep an eye on what's going on within these marine protected areas. However, this area is humongous, and it's also in the open ocean. And these are seamounts. Very few of these, uh, they look like islands, but very few of them actually break the surface. This is the part of the Hawaiian island chain that, that you know, the hot spot stayed in one place, and then the plate was moving, and then created all of these these seamounts that eventually sunk down into the ocean with huge biodiversity. It also means that there are a lot of fish that will come here because all of the cold, deep water in the open ocean hits these seamounts and then it has no place to go but up. And so it's very nutrient rich and fish from all over the Pacific Ocean will often come to these seamounts 
to feed and to breed and to meet with one another. And so there's a lot of fishing that went on there before this marine protected area was created. And now one of the greatest challenges is that it's so large and so amazing that it's very expensive and very challenging just to even have enough people to patrol it to make sure that it is protected. So that's something for future generations and, and many of us to think about if you're interested in protecting our world oceans, especially on a day like World Oceans Day, is to think about some of these big challenges we have. We can take the steps to try to protect these areas, but what can we do to try to keep those protections strong, especially when it's in the middle of the open ocean? Literally in the middle. <laughs> but it is such an amazing place. And I mean, I know that there have been script scientists that have gone out here to do research to understand how these reefs are doing. Um, and there's also many people who, who go to Hawaii and don't even realize that this record-breaking marine protected area is really not that far away. So if anyone's going to Hawaii, keep in mind, this is pretty cool and <laughs> not that far away. Let's see. So as we as we come towards the end of our our presentation, um, we, let's see. Can you can you sum it up for us, Delaney? T tell us what's uh, round up MPAs for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about the the human element and the animal element. Um, and this line here really sums it up is that these marine protected areas, they provide sanctuaries for marine organisms um, and the sensitive habitats that these animals live in. So um, it's really important that these we have this network of areas that are protected. You know, as much as as on an individual level, you can take action to do your part. And, you know, if you go to the beach and you happen to encounter an animal that you're being respectful, you're keeping your distance. Um, kind of the fun saying is that you um, you go and you you just leave memories or you you leave footprints but you take memories home with you so you're not leaving anything that shouldn't have been there you're not taking anything that you shouldn't be taking with you but on a larger scale you know for people or businesses that depend on the ocean in order to live and survive um, you know those regulations might not be as prioritized as I need fish and I need food you know. So it's important to have these areas. And, and like you talked about that spillover effect, you know, it ends up benefiting people in the long run. It ends up benefiting animals in the long run. So I think patience is another important part of, of establishing this network is that it's going to take time to see, to see the outcomes. But um, in the long run, they're going to be really positive and going to benefit us for the greater good. Definitely. There are so many stakeholders who who have opinions on how and what and why. So if you feel that marine protected areas are, are an important thing to keep going along the California coast, make sure that, that your government officials know that because there are many people who may advocate advocate that they don't want marine protected areas. But if it's something important to you, you can you can make your voice heard to try to create more of these protected places along our coast. So I wanted to really say thank you to all of you guys. We have gotten so many comments saying happy World Oceans Day. Yeah, marine protected areas. So thank you all for tuning in and, and listening to our chat. It was a little different today, but we appreciate you learning about it because especially if you live here in California or anywhere along the coast or Great Lakes or even many rivers, your voice can make a difference to create these protected spaces for the habitats and creatures that live below the surface. So very, very important. So guys, for World Oceans Day, it, to us, it wasn't quite enough. So we actually have more live broadcasts through the week. They're going to be at 10 a.m. on Tuesday and Thursday. We've changed the Thursday one to also be 10 a.m. in case there are any classes that like to tune in. We've had some students that are able to tune in. So hi, if there are any students out there today. But then also this evening at six Pacific, we have our very first virtual Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science lecture. So anyone here in San Diego, you may have attended one of those evening lectures that feature Scripps Oceanography scientists. Uh, but now we're doing them virtually and we're really excited to welcome Dr. Michael Latz, who's gonna be talking about the bioluminescence event that we had off of our shore. And I don't, Delaney, didn't you and I do a bioluminescence <laughs> chat earlier? 
good, but if you I want to hear- we did. It's all blurring together now, but Dr. Michael Latz has 40 years of experience studying okay. living light and glowing organisms. Yeah. So um, I did a practice run with him last week and I have to say, I am very excited for this uh, presentation later tonight. So if you guys can tune in, it'll be on Facebook and YouTube. And again, that's 6 p.m. tonight. So, hey, Delaney, happy World Oceans Day. Yeah, happy World Oceans Day, Caitlin. And um, please, you know, stay connected with us this week. If you've got little ones at home and um, you need fun things to do, we're going to be releasing some fun at home um, educational science activities, experiments. So um, we hope to engage you guys this week in, in celebrating our ocean. And definitely happy World Oceans Day to all of you guys from Birch Aquarium. <laughs> definitely from Birch Aquarium. Thank you guys so much. We'll see definitely. you next time. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. <laughs>